morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is titled Data Friend or Full. My name is John Bunyan. I'm the International Business Development Manager here at Chem. Uh, and today with me, we have Suzanne Crocker, who is uh, a product manager over at Cambridge International. And she is here to give us a, a run through of Data Friend or Full. Uh, she's currently spent about four years at Cambridge. Uh, prior to that, she spent over 13 years uh, working in a series of secondary schools uh, before moving up to senior management team and obviously making most of education management, uh, the school data progression tracking, and using that data to identify and support pupils. Along with that, it's designing intervention strategies and, uh, and processes to improve outcomes for all of our students. Now, what we've got today, what we're going to run through in Data Friend or Four is going to be, uh, where do we start with uh, data and data management? Importantly, who should have access to data uh, and what you can use to the data to have a real impact on uh, student achievement and aspirations in the school. Um, and obviously, what we want to do is find out what we can do to action all of this data. Uh, so we want to know how we can use data to transform our school. Now, just to give you a quick run through of today, you're all muted, as I'm sure you've uh, you should be out by now. Uh, if you've got any questions, please use the question function on the right-hand side of your screen. Or if you've got a general comment you'd like everybody to see, uh, pop it in the chat function, and then we can uh, address all of those at the end. Now, Suzanne is going to speak uh, for around about 30 minutes, after which time we'll do a quick poll, um, and, we'll, uh, and I'll share the results with you, and followed by some time for questions and answers. Uh, they should not take any longer than an hour. Uh, so you can have a good idea of how much time you're going to get back at the end. Now, uh, before, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Suzanne. Uh, she's going to begin our presentation. I'm going to mute and get rid of my picture so you can concentrate on the presentation. Uh, Suzanne, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much to everybody who is has joined us today. Um, I am mean, going to talk about data, friend or foe. Um, I'm going to start about with this uh, quote that I like very much. Data has the potential to transform education from a model of mass production to a personalised experience that meets the needs of individuals and ensures that no student is lost along the way. How do you know how well each of your students is progressing? How can you produce evidence of what they have achieved and how do you know what gaps in knowledge they have? In the school, there are many, many different types of data. I've just put uh, a little bit of a, a list together here of all the different information that you could have from whole school data to teacher generated data. And it can be a little bit of a maze and some of the data can actually um, contradict other data so I'm just putting out here things to consider so different data sources having more than one data source makes the data more valid for example baseline data tests and teach generated reports however having too many different pieces of information can confuse the management of the data is the key. Teacher generated levels need to be accurate and consistent, for example, end of unit tests, moderation of marking, clear criteria on reporting current grades or levels. Baseline tests, such as the chem ones, are shown to be very accurate, but they are not based on subject knowledge. But using them to interpret outcomes across subjects takes skill and understanding and training. Um, we're looking at the uh, accuracy and consistency of data, up-to-date information, regular reporting. Data goes out of date, so regular reporting is important. Um, in the UK, you're now required to report three times a year. It's important to give teachers and pupils enough time to show progress in the teaching and learning. And it's important that senior leaders have an understanding on how different subjects function. 
So in a knowledge-based subject, the levels and grades will improve within a module or a topic as a st the student studies it, but there might be a dip once a, a student moves on to a new module or topic. Now, I'm a languages teacher, so I know that an ab initio language will start at a low level or grade, which may be at odds to people's other subject levels or grades. You need to think about your audience. Who is going to have access to this evidence? How will it be um, presented? Does everyone need to know everything? What is the best format to present the information? There will have to be some reporting to parents and students. Make sure the language is appropriate and explanations are clear to, involve, to avoid misunderstandings. You need to make sure that you can use the data for accountability and transparency. You need to understand the principles upon which the data, uh, for example, forecasts are made. One school that I worked at decided that for GCSE, all the forecasts for all the subjects should be a star because that was aspirational. But it was for, possible for teachers to find out the real forecast grades because they had access to the IT system. So over inflating the forecast grades demoralised the students and the teachers alike and created an atmosphere of mistrust. This is very important, staff training in data collection and interpretation. How to administer assessments or tests and um, we're talking about formative tests as opposed to summative tests. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And improving the accuracy and consistency of the staff data. Often teachers will overestimate if they feel they're being judged or underestimate, especially for public exams or to motivate the students. It's important at department le level to have consistency and a shared understanding that is sharing good practice and moderation of marking. Having a shared understanding of how to interpret data is also very important. Using staff knowledge and experience with the data underpinning any judgments that they make. And in order to do this, my final point is teachers need time and resources in gathering and manipulating the data. And when I say manipulating the data, reading it, analysing it, and coming out with um, outcomes and uh, action points. So here I have an example of some baseline data um, and at a teaching level you would use it to identify individual pupil strengths and weaknesses and then you could use, set targets using standardised predictions. When I say standardised predictions, uh, that means it shows how your students have scored compared to others of the same age who have taken the same assessment. The baseline assessments look at vocabulary, maths and nonverbal skills, which means that knowledge of a subject is not required. This is really very useful. Uh, especially if you have a new intake, for example, in year seven or first year or uh, year 12, which is the first year of sixth form, you may have or at any point during the school um, year when you have new students. The baseline data then can then be applied to all subjects. So, for example, a lower vocabulary store could mean that the student will struggle accessing the curriculum especially in language-based subjects such as English and history. A low maths score could affect maths, but also science and any subject where numeracy is required. You could also look at the data comparing within a cohort. It gives you an idea of the overall ability of a cohort. If you have a very able cohort and you set, would you increase the size of your top set to maximise potential? If you have a large tail end, so we're looking here at the D column, do you bring in extra resources to support them? So as I say, at the beginning of a year when, for example, in year seven or first year, if, if you do this comparison, it's very good for senior leaders to be able to target their, their resources.
You could also do a comparison with previous cohorts, and this is again chem data. And using this, you could spot patterns. You could look at a historical cohort with a similar profile, and you could look at the resources and interventions you've implemented and look at the outcomes that you got before. So you are using historical data in order to plan future interventions. You also are going to need evidence of what worked and decide how you're going to implement any resources and interventions with your current cohort. So baseline test, baseline data is only the start of your data journey. It's important that you sh data doesn't just have to be predicted grades. It's not just about the numbers. It can include attendance and behavior and self-evaluation. Now, this is an example of um, some, a progress report that was created by subject teachers in one of the schools that I have worked at. Uh, and it was so we have three students, we have their percentage attendance, because of course, uh, in order to learn, you have got to be at school. Um, we've got EAL, English as an additional language, yes or no. And then we've got the attainment levels in numbers at the end of the previous school year. And then we've got a prediction, okay? But the bit I would like you to look at is a bit highlighted in yellow. This was created by uh, teachers just as a measure of how these students were progressing. So we've got progress towards the target and then we've got a scale of one to five. We also have effort, behaviour and organisation. And it meant that uh, middle leaders, department heads, year heads could track and identify any gaps in knowledge or any um, areas where an intervention could take place in order to improve outcomes. So for example, student two is below expectations in progress towards their English target. Their effort is below expectation, as is their behavior. And their organization is cause for concern. And although I have anonymized the data, this is in fact, um, true data and this particular student uh, wasn't very organized and always lost their books never did their homework and always lost their, all of their their pencil case so we put an intervention in in order to support them and their progress effort and behavior went up with their improvement in organization i am going to spend about 15 to 20 minutes talking about self-evaluation because as I said earlier baseline tests are only the beginning of the data journey you need to be able to track progress improve the teaching and learning in order to improve outcomes and you need to be able to reflect on good practice and you need to be able to measure, i.e. produce evidence to show if the improvement in teaching and learning has improved the outcome for the student. And I've got here an example of an improvement cycle. Um, it's using uh, British terminology. So you're going to start off with an improvement plan. And I believe that every school will have an improvement plan for over the year. You implement it. How do you know that if it's work? Then you have internal monitoring, sorry, self-evaluation. And then you might have external monitoring, whether that is uh, an inspector from Cambridge or whether it's another body or whether it's senior leaders. And then you have a progress report. Uh, or a summative assessment and then you have self-review where you put together some ideas uh, that you're going to implement in your next improvement plan so in order for this cycle to work we need data in order to show 
how we're doing now as a school, what are we doing well? And how can we build on these successes? So sharing good practice. Who isn't learning? And what aren't they learning? So strengths and weaknesses of the students. Is there something in our teaching practice that could be causing that? What evidence do we have that we can be sure? What can we do to improve? How will we know if it works? What do we do if it doesn't work? So, data, things for you to consider. Do you currently have a way of measuring the effectiveness of this area or that area in your school or classroom? How would you know as a teacher, a head of department, a head of year, a senior leader, where your strengths are? How do you know where your challenges are? Are you planning for improvement? Could you measure the impact of the improvements that take place? I like this quote, improvement is a change with direction, sustained over time, that moves entire systems, raising the average level of quality and performance, whilst at the same time decreasing the variation among units and engaging people in analysis and understanding of why some actions seem to work and others don't. So which data and why? So we've got here teacher observations, uptake of professional development. And it's important to say that professional development doesn't have to be from external sources. You have a wealth of expertise and skills and experience within your own staff. So professional development could be co-teaching. It could be teaching across subjects. An example I'd like to give there is I taught a series of lessons with a history teacher and that involved observing each other's lessons. So me as a languages teacher, my partner as a history teacher, we did observations and we talked about good practice and then we co-planned a languages lesson and a history lesson taking the good practice that we had seen from each other's lessons and then we taught it and we we observed each other again and then as a further um, experiment my partner uh, planned a history lesson and I went and taught it and it gave me a different perspective it also gave me many ideas about how I could improve in my own teaching. And then, of course, uh, we can look at summative assessment results. Where could all this data come from? And we've got here four particular areas. The data can come from the student, from the teacher, the school and the system. And it should go round. It shouldn't get stuck anywhere. It shouldn't be a one-way uh, track. So as the information goes up, the system should be able to feed back down uh, information as well. I'm going to go back to teaching and learning and the fact that data doesn't necessarily need to be grades or levels. Um, one area that I've always been particularly interested in is um, student voice or uh, staff voice and I've got some information here with feedback about teaching and learning that you might find of interest. So this is just a visitor questionnaire. Okay this is data that you can use to improve your environment. This is a teacher questionnaire that you could use uh, to gauge um, uh, teachers' attitudes. This is just a very simple um, data gathering exercise from a senior leader who is observing a lesson. So you can see A to Z and then A to B to C to is a seating plan they are students and this 
the focus of this observation was on teacher questioning. And you can see um, negative interaction, positive interaction, and ask the question of a student. This will help to identify possibly the silent middle, um, but also uh, the kind of interactions that a teacher has with the class and vice versa. Here is student voice, it's a student questionnaire. And if you talk to students themselves, they have a very good idea about barriers to learning and what helps them learn and what makes learning more difficult. And this can be really useful to set targets and improve um, outcomes. Uh, there's one just filled in. What we also did at the end of each topic or unit, or even at the end of each lesson, there was a review done by the students. So did this lesson or topic achieve its stated aims? Did you find the work too easy, about right, too difficult? Did you receive feedback? And which ways of working do you find most helpful? So this is also useful feedback to inform lesson planning. Now, I'm aware that time is marching on. So my original question was data, friend or foe. And actually, what I would like to say is data is just data, it's information. It's what you do with it that is the most important thing. And having been through a school improvement project where I headed up the data and intervention strand, my advice would be, get a good quality whole school data system and make sure that you've got good management of it. And that doesn't mean to say that you need anything fancy, just being able to use an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, is you can keep the tools as simple and as accessible as possible. Have good quality data generation and reporting. Make sure that everybody's clear on how to report accurate and consistent data. Make sure that um, data is at the top of every single departmental meeting, whether they are moderating their marking or whether they are looking at the data and are discussing interventions for students within their subject or they're looking at the data as a result of an intervention and talking about what they could do to improve if the intervention hasn't worked. Use appropriate data for each audience in a suitable format. In the beginning, when we did our school transformation project, we delivered the same data on predicted grades and progress towards grades to parents as we did to teachers and it caused an awful lot of confusion with parents and a lot of panicking. And as we went along, we targeted the data a lot more accurately. It doesn't mean to say that we hid anything, we were totally transparent, but it did mean that we thought about our audience. This is really important and I've been hosting the CHEM webinars over the last couple of months and I know this is very high on people's um, agenda, training on how to interpret the data. So you need accurate data, consistent data in the first place, but you need continuous training on how to interpret the data correctly or accurately. Senior leaders need a clear vision on what the data is used for. Data should be used for asking questions. It shouldn't be used for making judgments, it should be used for asking the questions, is, can this classroom improve, can this student improve, what are the student's strengths and weaknesses, use the questions to improve the teaching and learning within the school. And this is probably almost the most important thing, 
start with a pilot. Start small and implement lessons learned. That way you will be able to adapt any data system, data collection, any intervention system to the context of the school that you are in. It will also mean that you will have the goodwill of your staff because instead of being overwhelmed with a whole school um, change, they will be able to feed back and you, as I say, will be able to adapt your system to your particular school, to your particular moment in time. And never just think just because you've introduced a system that it is um, set in stone. Keep reviewing and make sure that it is fit for purpose. So, uh, John, thank you very much. I have finished and hopefully we've got some questions. OK, thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, much appreciated indeed. Uh, now, before we uh, pitch into the questions, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you a quick poll. I'm going to launch that now for you. Now, if you could, uh, if you could do me the, uh, the honour of completing our poll for me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll share the results with you afterwards. Uh, just collating the questions now for Suzanne, but if you've got any more, please do pop them in the questions box and then we'll try and get to them all. Any that we don't get to now, uh, we will make sure that we reply independently as well. So whatever questions you've got, we will do our very best to answer them now. If not, they will be following later. No, I can see some questions coming through now. Uh, please continue to pop through the questions. Uh, I'll field them all and uh, I'll pop through what we can to Suzanne. Uh, once again, uh, we're going to make sure that this ends in good time. So we've got about another half an hour. Um, and uh, if we run out of time, we don't manage to answer all the questions then, uh, then please. Uh, be confident that we will reply independently via email. John, is it worth saying that if the attendees have any themes or areas that they'd like to have a webinar on, if they put it in the questions section as well, we will certainly consider it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I was going to come to that a little bit later. OK, thank you. I'm going to close the poll now. Uh, and you can now see the results. So, yeah, the question, what is the biggest obstacle for the implementation of data policy in your school? Now, top result we've got here by some margin is training, Suzanne. Uh, training uh, followed by access to data. Then we've got uh, clarity, uh, some vision and direction, uh, and then uh, bringing up the end is other. Yeah, so I'm going to hide that now. So we know where to start, Suzanne. So we're starting with training, uh, starting with access to data. So I'm going to hide that now for us. Now, well, that's uh, interesting. Now, I'm just going to comment that? on that, if that's all right. Um, yeah. I think in every single webinar that we have done, training has come out as number one, and uh, access to data has come out as number two. Remember, I would say that data isn't necessarily it's just information and it isn't necessarily created by other people you can create your own data if you remember earlier on with that slide we got the teachers creating their own data by showing uh effort behavior and organization you can create some data yourselves but you need to have a shared vision and a shared agreement across the school about how you're going to report and most importantly what you're going to do with the data because having data and doing nothing with it is a waste of your time okay super uh i'll leave that up for the moment uh it might prompt a few more questions uh but uh 
Let me see. First question we've got here. How can you score effort and organisation objectively? Thank you, Dima. That's a really good question. And it's how can you score anything objectively? So what we did was we put together a definition for each of our levels, if you like, one to five. And we did um, a lot of training beforehand. And uh, we had whole school training for staff where we discussed what we felt were the attributes for each of the level. How would we know if we were looking at a student who was exceeding expectations? How would we know if we had a cause for concern? And we put together almost like not a, a brief case study, so a brief definition for each one. Uh, so when we actually came to do the reporting, we had a shared vision, but also because we started with a pilot, we could tweak that definition. And then because of training and ongoing training and ongoing discussions within departments, especially, we could almost monitor that we were still being consistent uh, as a staff in our reporting. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, next question up. Um, I mean, the question here is in what ways can data be analysed? But uh, I appreciate that that is going to be um, one uh, quite quite a wide area. So if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to narrow that down a bit. Uh, in, in what would you say the best ways in which uh, data can be analysed in this context? I think for each person or role analysing the data, they have got to have an objective. So if you are subject staff, you subject teacher analysing your class data, you need data that's relevant to that. So for example, you need um, a perhaps to have baseline data on vocabulary uh, or maths, you need to have some predicted data because you need to know where that student is heading. And you need to have progress data about how they are getting towards their predicted grade. If you're going to break it down into a smaller chunk, if you like, you need to know what the student's strengths and weaknesses are within a particular unit or a particular skill. For example, if you're teaching history and you're teaching, I don't know, medicine through the ages, which is just a, a GCSE topic, um, you need to know, uh, it, does the student have the essay skills to argue effectively? And you need to have evidence of that so you can break it down further. How do you know that the, each of the students in your class has achieved the um, learning outcomes you have sent for that particular um, lesson or series of lessons. Okay, so that's subject. Then if you're moving up to somebody like a pastoral leader ahead of year, you need different data or data to, uh, presented in a different way. And you need to have all the subject data for all the different subjects. Um, so in all, it's a data management system that you is really, really important. I think what tends to happen is that different people in different roles get all the data and what they have to analyse, first of all, is what data they need out of this mass of information. I would say that you need a data manager to take that part away from them because data analysis shouldn't be onerous and it shouldn't take huge amounts of a subject teacher or a pastoral head's time because the main objective or their main role isn't analysing data. Yeah, thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, Broad question here. Uh, what is the meaning of data, friend or for in this context here? I started off with this title because I know when I first started uh, being 
responsible for managing data for my colleagues, I thought it was a foe. I thought it was a stick to 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 wave at me, it to you know in, to improve my teaching. And I feel that a lot of my colleagues thought that as well because it was a bit of a mystery. We weren't math teachers. We couldn't man manipulate spreadsheets. And I think as I progressed and as we set up this new system within school, um, it became almost like a eureka moment. Data was my friend. It was, I know that this student hasn't understood the past tense in French. Therefore, I need to plug that gap. And that is the only way I could analyze that was by having the data. And it is very, actually very motivational to the students themselves because they are, they are shown evidence that they're making progress. They are shown that if they do X, Y, and Z or follow an intervention, then they can improve their grades. And it, it is motivational, it helps with engagement. So really I was trying to say data is just data for what you do with it, either mystifies it or demystifies it. And I, after my um, journey, my data journey, I would say data is definitely a friend. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And just uh, just adding a little bit on the end of that, um, it's to give you all a little bit of context. Often when uh, often when schools or anybody for that matter um, registers or well subscribes to a particular product or service, they they do it to to achieve a particular objective, a particular uh, they have a particular need within the school or the organisation. Um, but once once they've got that, uh, once once they've got the data, uh, they start to see uh, all of these other things that they can do with the data. So it it, it open, opens up a, a huge new world for them. And the the more that they use the data, and the more that they they uh, they, they use the data uh, within the school, you find that uh, they start to use it in more and more comprehensive and varied and interesting ways, uh, and they start to link different data sources together. Uh, so simply taking baseline data, for example, there's, there's Suzanne's gone through in the presentation. Once you've used that information for a little while, then you, you start you start to add more to it because you see you can achieve more with it, and um, and that's just part of your data journey that uh, Suzanne was talking about. But uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to follow on. Uh, we have a, a follow up to an earlier question. Mm -hmm. um, how will we make sure uh, this will align with external international expected standards? You need to look at the external standards and break them down. It's like anything. Um, I like John said a minute ago, a data journey. Um, an example in the UK is that uh, all schools have got expected outcomes for GCSE or for A level or IB. You've all got to break that down. You can't suddenly expect to suddenly get these standards to suddenly arrive at the, the station, if you like, you've got to break it down into small chunks and you have got to decide how you're going to get there from along your journey. And you've got to decide how you are going to present the evidence, how you're going to measure the evidence. And I think really importantly, and it takes experience, you've got to decide what you're going to do if you don't achieve what you want to do in your small chunk and to go along your journey you've got to have as I say bite sized steps and see whether they work or not it's a bit like having a project uh, and having a critical path you know where you want to go and you break it down into um, jobs or this term we're going to focus on this Next term, we're going to focus on that. And then you get a series of, um, I would say, actions, outcomes. And then when you've analysed it, um, action points to, that you need to work on. I don't know whether that's clear enough, John. 
No, I think that's absolutely, uh, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, it's an interesting question that we could probably talk all day about, but uh, yes. <laughs> I think that's that's certainly one way of putting it in a nutshell. Uh, let me see. Um, okay, probably more specific. Uh, in your experience, is there any particular system or software that you think is uh, best used to manage the data by different users? I would say use the simplest. You don't need fancy software. We used Excel. I think having the structure and the management is the most important thing. I think really deciding who needs what data in making sure that the data is accurate and consistent and making sure that the data is actually used uh, effectively is more important than whatever software package. And I think in one of the previous webinars, somebody said, uh, what do you use? And I said Excel, because Excel is the, the most accessible one. OK, fantastic. Um, next one. Um, historic data, predicted data, um, and actual data always varies as every batch is different. How would you see it in the context of school performance? Well, I'll start with historical data because I've got a concrete example for that. Um, when we compared cohorts, we did it at quite a high level. Um, so in one particular school, we knew that we had a very able cohort. So, but we also had a very weak tail end. We didn't have many people or many students coming in in year seven in the middle. So we knew that we needed to have, expand our, our top set, um, but we also knew that we needed to uh, improve the support. So, uh, so we had teaching assistants that came in and supported in the lower sets. And we also knew from the data that came in, we had some behavior issues. And what we actually did was we had a big top set which was mixed. And then in languages, we had a second and a third set usually. So what we did was we actually had two second sets and we had a girl's set and a boy's set. Now you might not work like that, but it was really very, very successful because the girls and the boys concentrated. We taught them in different ways. Um, there is um, Mike Younger, Professor Mike Younger at Cambridge University did some work about single sex teaching and we followed his research paper and his, some of his suggestions and we taught the boys differently to the girls. And the top set, which was bigger than usual, um, progressed as we would expect. I think we had, instead of 28, I think we had 32, 33 in there. And the girls and the boys have said they progressed just because we'd had this all of this information and we were able to think about it compared to historical um, data and some of the interventions we put in previously. But each intervention in each year is unique, but you can take some of the ideas that you've known have worked and adapt them to the particular context. Could you tell me which other data that we were dealing with? There were three lots of data. Uh, you see those historic, predictive, and actual. Okay, so actual and predictive, you need to have a connection between the two because you need to, the actual is where they are at now. And I do know that we had many, many discussions and um, many training sessions and many examples given out to staff about what actual meant so you need to have a shared understanding of what that is but think of it as almost a, a, a path how do you get from actual to predicted um, and what I didn't show you is some of the chem data uses chances graphs and you can see that um, a particular student a particular uh, subject has a range of grades that they could reach. Some are more likely than others. And you have to be very careful about predicted grades because predicted grades aren't a ceiling. They aren't inevitable. And I think that 
students, parents and teachers need to realise that there are certain stepping stones that need to be in place in order for the students to get the grades. Um, things like attendance, behaviour, organisation um, and also effective teaching and learning. You can have an incredibly hard worker who might not achieve a really high grade uh, because um, they work hard but they don't necessarily have the skills or the knowledge to achieve in an exam. They don't might not have the exam technique. Don't forget, as well as the subject and the knowledge, you need to have exam technique as well. So I hope that helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, just adding to that and uh, to a previous question as well, we've got uh, we're, we're talking about the systems that you use and the answer was uh, pick a simple one. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's, I think, probably the same for the data itself. I think the more complicated you make the data, um, the more convoluted it might be, is uh, you make it less accessible. So you need to think very much about who you're presenting the data to, and for, and as you said, Suzanne, for, for what for what objective. Uh, incredibly important that you get both of those pieces of puzzle, puzzles right, because in the same way in a classroom, if if, uh, if a student cannot access the learning, and somebody, whoever you're presenting the data to can't access it and understand it, then the data, the data itself becomes a bit redundant and you're probably wasting time. So it really is important to uh, make sure it's as simple as it needs to be without being overly simple for, yeah. the, for the audience at hand. And, and um, I think this leads on to um, this leads on to another question, which would be um, what data um, would you suggest schools share with parents? And if so, what do they need to do to I think the important thing for parents is you. we talked a lot about effort behaviour organisation. We talked a lot about progress within a unit of time. So as I said earlier, in the UK now you have to report three times a year. You used to have to report six times a year. So parents will want to know progress from one data point to the next. And I think Tony Emerson had a good point in one of his previous seminars. And he said, don't report data for data's sake. It's really, really important to map the school year and to find out when the significant points are. So for example, you might want to set. So in the first year, you get your baseline data at the beginning of the year, you get data from the previous school, from the, the junior or primary school, and then you do your sets. Then, maybe after six or seven weeks, perhaps, then you have a reporting of data on progress because you might need to move people around a little bit because they're not performing according to their data. Then you map throughout the school year when you next want to have a data point. So it could be when you do reports or you have a parents evening and you need to have data needs to be fresh it needs to be current and when you talk to parents you could especially at GCSE A level IB you might talk about their predicted grades but I think it helps the parent and the student to break it down a little bit to say in the next reporting period i.e. I don't know term or during the next unit because we are going to have a formative test at the end here are some areas that your child or your the student themselves can work on in order to improve and I would say this is our end goal this is our prediction and where the student is now and what they can do to improve actually write down some targets because then the parent can measure it themselves. Parents like to be able to measure things like is this person doing their homework? Well they can control that. Um, is this person organised? Are they putting enough effort in? Um, I've done a lot of academic mentoring based on this where we've taken targeted students and given them a, a mentor where we have given specific 
targets and we've shared with with parents for example i had one young man who was not allowed to sit next to his best friend and that was a target because when they sat next to each other you know their behavior went down their effort went down and the parent could take that as a target and discuss it with the student and it was tangible and outcomes improved so as i say it's not it is about teaching and learning but there are other um areas where students can get themselves better outcomes and two examples that the parents can help with are homework um behavior it could even be reading around a subject for english we often said do more reading well the parent can help with that they can go out and buy a book okay thank you very much um this is probably going to be the last question and uh, i'm just conscious that we're running out of time a little bit suzanne but uh any other questions uh, do fire them through we'll make sure they all get answered uh, i'm going to see quite a few on future webinars uh, ideas for those but the last one i think i'm going to pitch to you is that um we have uh we have what we were, going, we're going to call a novice researcher i think here in this context uh and they're saying although the researchers put all their effort into the project uh, the numbers that they're seeing do not reflect success perhaps some even reflect stagnation or even worse um so what advice would you give to that have you taken a step back and uh mapped out your whole process um have you looked at your structure have you looked at whether there is a shared vision about what the data is for and how it's being used uh before we did a the transformation project we spent six months uh getting information from staff parents students and we actually mapped out the school year for each year group before we put together the structure of our data management system. And then we, as we introduced our new system, we got feedback and we made changes. Um, I think the important thing is to have senior leadership buy-in. I think the import next important thing is to never give up because stagnation makes you feel as though something isn't working. Um, it can work. Um, it, there is inertia to begin with, with any new system, which is why I suggest starting with a pilot for a new system um, to bring the staff on board um, and to get their engagement and their support. I could probably talk for ages about this, but I think I'd better stop there. Just adding to that from my own experience is that um, the data that you see, any any any, any data, um, is is there to prompt questions, and, and quite often any good data source will probably ask more questions than it actually answers. It it tells you where to look next. Um, yes. So if you've got perhaps data that is reflecting stagnation, then that perhaps prompts a question as well: why? is uh, if, if we're doing different things is it what what's changed what's not changed so the question then is are we are we, are we looking at the right things are we, are we asking the right questions are we using the right data sets in order to 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 answer those questions so i mean the data itself and even even stagnation actually prompts questions um it, it, it may seem a bit counterintuitive but uh, often it I'm going to chip in there because you need answers to the questions and the answers to the questions comes from the teaching and learning side of it. You need a reaction on that side within a school in order for the questions to be answered. And that, that's why I've got the data being information. I've got the um, improvements cycle and it's really important to have it working hand in hand because if you answer que if you ask questions and are, there aren't any responses or aren't any answers, that's where people become um, disengaged with 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 the system because it doesn't help them. They can't see any improvement. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, conscious <laughs> now that we are starting to come to the end. Um, thank you all very much for your questions. I can see a number of suggestions here 
um, for future webinars uh, around um, around uh, sort of uh, training on data management, uh, and it, it seems very much around. I mean, very similar to the poll that we saw, which was uh, which was training is very much a part of uh, what people would like to see, not what people would like to see now, what people would like to see in the future. Uh, on that note, um, we are busy developing uh, uh, more training, more sophisticated training methods within the business. Uh, we will be running more webinars, and again, the webinars will be directed in large by the feedback and the comments that we get from, from you, our kind of audience, uh, and certainly this will be reflected in the upcoming series of webinars. Uh, there are a multitude of training options available. Um, Suzanne, I know you were going to say something now. I was just going to say there is no one correct system. So I've implemented a data transformation in four schools and each time it was relevant to the context of the school I was in. And that's really important. So I'm hopefully giving you some ideas and the training will give you some ideas, but there is no single easy fix answer. Is what I was going to say. No, there, there, there really is. There really is. <laughs> but uh, so that leads us uh, up nicely to the end of the webinar. Um, that just leaves me to say thank you very much, Suzanne Crockett, for your time and effort today. It's been absolutely fantastic. We have some lovely comments in the chat for you to have a look at later. Okay. Thank you all very much, our audience, uh, because this is why we do it. Uh, this is why we do the webinars uh, to, for benefit of yourselves. Uh, so thank you all very much for attending and your attention. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, your you. participation uh, engagement will be emailed later today. Uh, the, just to repeat, the uh, recording of the webinar will be available on our training and events page on cam.org uh, from next week. Um, and uh, that uh, is about it from us. Uh, Suzanne, any last words? Otherwise, I shall end the webinar here. Just thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share my um, experiences and ideas with you. Okay. Thank you all once again. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we look forward to seeing you next time.